This is the second lesson in a series looking at development of an embryo through to fetus and birth. These are the learning objectives associated with today's lesson. We're focusing, as I said, on stem cells and the embryonic germ layers. So it's important that you really pay attention to the learning objectives here and are able to achieve them when studying. These are the key words associated with today's lesson. Again, lots of new words. Please make sure that you use your glossary and your textbook to help you understand these words and use them appropriately. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be looking at is cell differentiation and what that means. So when cells reproduce very rapidly over and over again, this is known as proliferation. We met this word in the previous lesson when we referred to the zygote um, rapidly undergoing mitosis. So that was rapid proliferation of cells to form uh, the morula, which is that solid ball of cells at day three. And then eventually we had the blastocyst with its um, inner cell mass. Now we said that that inner cell mass, which was um, a collection of stem cells, um, will become an embryo. And how that's achieved is through the process of differentiation. Now differentiation is when these blank canvas unspecialized stem cells will start to develop characteristics that are specific to a certain cell type. So for example, we've got hepatic cells or liver cells, cardiac muscle cells, nerve cells, and so on. We know that cells of one type are known as a tissue, and these all work together to have a common function. So for example, skeletal muscle cells or intestinal cells working together. All right, so now we're going to be looking at the level of differentiation in stem cells. And we're going to start from the top here. And these cells are totipotent cells. So these cells have the ability to form the embryo and the membranes that surround and nourish it. So this can essentially form a totally new individual. So these stem cells are very early on and they can form a brand new embryo. And they are, they are derived from that inner cell mass of the blastocyst. As we go down a layer, we have less specialized stem cells, but still quite precious. These are called pluripotent stem cells. Now these are still good, but not as um, impressive as the totipotent ones. They can give rise to most, but not all tissue types um, in an organism. And this also is derived from the inner cell mass. So totipotent cells can become any cell type, pluripotent stem cells can become most cell types. So the next level down are multipotent stem cells. And these can give rise to cells that have a specific function. So for example, in adults, you and I will have multipotent stem cells in our bone marrow. Okay, so all stem cells start with the same DNA but then they end up looking different. And why does that happen? So of course the answer is differentiation, but we're going to be looking at how differentiation happens. So some genes, so that's pieces of genetic code within chromosomes can remain switched off while others become switched on. So every single cell has the ability to become any of these specialized types. But let's say this stem cell um, only is switching on the ability to become a neuron, it will switch off its ability to become cardiac cells, blood cells, or liver cells. Now, when these stem cells lose, um, sorry, when they differentiate, they lose that ability to divide and produce more cells of other cell types. So they're committing to one path. So, if you go back and look at this diagram here, we can see that these curly arrows are showing that some stem cells will create more stem cells. So why does that happen? Well, these undifferentiated stem cells will remain in the body and it's the body's way of producing more stem cells for self-renewal if it's needed. So you can see here that once a stem cell commits a differentiation, um, it cannot go back. It's described as terminally differentiated. 
So terminal means to stop, so it cannot go back and do other things. So we need to have a bank of stem cells for self-renewal. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at obtaining stem cells from embryos. So we want to get the stem cells as early on as possible because they'll have gone through the least amount of differentiation. So if we want to get uh, totipotent stem cells, we'd have to go for a day three post um, fertilization. So remember, this is all completely artificial. So this happens in vitro. So what that means is that's Latin for in glass. So we get sperm and an egg and we fertilize them in a Petri dish and we culture those uh, resulting cells. So here we've got a morula and it's a ball of cells and we take them at day three and they're totipotent. If we allow that um, morula to continue to form into a blastocyst, we can derive cells from the inner cell mass and these cells will be pluripotent. So pluripotent cells, remember, they can become any cell type but they cannot form a new individual. Uh, because some of that differentiation process has already started. So these cells from the inner cell mass can be removed and cultured to form pluripotent stem cells. And scientists will use them to create something known as an immortal cell line. So they'll just keep differentiating over and over and they'll just put them in other Petri dishes. And they can use that to study how um, stem cells work and perhaps creating other therapies. So if we obtain stem cells from adults, this is more common um, and that's a therapy that we accept as being used right now. So these stem cells are not pluripotent. So these stem cells cannot become any other cell type, but only a limited range. So these are multipotent stem cells. So the typical example is the red bone marrow that is found in the epiphyses of the long bones down here and here. And from that, those multipotent cells, we can get this range of blood cells. So the platelets, the white blood cells, and the red blood cells. So while they are different cell types, they are within that narrow range of blood cells. So bone marrow can produce any other type of blood cell, but not any other cell. Okay, so here's an image just to summarize what we've talked about so far. Stem cells can be either embryonic, or adult stem cells. Embryonic stem cells can be totipotent, where they can divide into um, a whole new organism, or they can be pluripotent, where they can be any specialized type of cell, and we derive that from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst. Adult stem cells can only be multipotent, and we get a narrow range of cell types. Okay, so let's just test what you know so far. So first question, some genes can be switched on while others can be switched off to produce specific cell types. What would we describe this definition as being? Okay, the answer is differentiation. Pluripotent, totipotent stem cells refer to the type of cell, not the process. Undifferentiated cells that have the ability to become any other these are stem cells. Totipotent cells that have the ability to become a brand new individual. Is that true or false? And that is true. Okay, pluripotent stem cells can differentiate into a heart cell. That is also true. They can become most cell types. It just can't form a new individual. One stem cell could theoretically make millions of stem cells. And again, that's true. Okay, so hopefully you are able to achieve uh, at least three out of five in that quiz. Um, if not, please make sure that you go back and review your notes on this section. Okay, so as we alluded to before, um, stem cell research is quite a big area of interest because we can use these cells therapeutically to help people that have certain diseases. And the three sources of stem cells could be the umbilical cord blood and placental stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and of course, adult stem cells, which we know is used in treating certain types of cancer.
So cord blood stem cells are multipotent. Um, they can be used by the mother or the baby. So that means um, it's going to be really useful for both of them. And this tissue is normally discarded and thrown away, but we can keep that now and use that to help people. Now, there is actually a national bank where you can store umbilical cord stem cells, and that's a company called Oscord. Now, parents may choose to donate the, the cord blood for public use, or they can use it in a private bank to use um, for their family in later life. Now, embryonic stem cells, um, as we talked about in that previous slide, are obtained using IVF embryos, which is in vitro fertilization embryos. This is completely done in a lab, and we are culturing embryonic stem cells. Now, couples do not store embryos, um, sorry, couples that do not store embryos um, when they are going through IVF may choose to donate these um, embryos to research. Um, the, there are bioethical issues surrounding this that you may want to think about, um, and there is strong legislation to protect the misuse of this um, tissue. What's good about embryonic stem cells is that they are pluripotent, and this means that they are versatile and can be um, can be used for more things than um, the adult stem cells. Disadvantage of these stem cells is that it could have rejection if it's not derived from your own cell types. Okay, so here's just a little summary diagram to show you how um, these pluripotent stem cells are extracted. So we have in vitro fertilization. We um, go through that normal process of cell culturing to produce the blastocyst. The inner cell mass is removed and cultured in a Petri dish. And these stem cells can be kept on um, theoretically forever in an immortal cell line to produce other stem cells, or they can be manipulated to be differentiated into specific tissue types as shown below. So in theory, we could create new neurons for someone, we could um, create new cardiac tissue if someone has a damaged heart, or even produce um, brand new blood from um, a lab-based product. Okay, so if we look at adult stem cells, we know that they are more limited because they are multipotent. Now, the advantage of using adult stem cells is that you can treat uh, diseases using your own cells. So this reduces the risk of rejection. Disadvantage is that these cells are already pre-specialized, which means you're very limited in what you can produce. Um, however, there is some research ongoing at the moment to see if we can reverse this pre-specialization and get adult stem cells to go back to the pluri or even multi, um, totipotent stage. So looking at the promise of stem cell research, it's quite an exciting area because these um, stem cells can be used to treat a number of diseases such as type 1 diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and types of cancer. Now, there are other therapeutic uses, as you can see in this diagram, and who knows what the future holds. That's the end of the first section, looking at stem cells. Please make sure that you read page 308 of your textbook and complete the booklet pages 22 to 23. Now that we understand about stem cells, we're going to be looking at pregnancy starting with the embryonic period, which is the first two months of pregnancy. We will look at the fetal period in a later lesson. All right, so this is what a developing embryo will start to look like. And you can see it doesn't really look very much like a baby, but um, it's emerging. So the blastocyst will burrow into the endometrium, and that is maintained by hormones secreted from the corpus luteum, as we've talked about before, those are progesterone and estrogen. At a later stage, the placenta will develop and that will start to secrete a hormone called human 
chorionic gonadotrophin, or HCG for short. So again, the embryonic period is the first two months or first eight weeks of pregnancy. And the, what we have at this stage is referred to as an embryo. Please don't call it a baby or a fetus. You will get marked down for that. This is the embryonic period, so we must refer to this as an embryo. By the end of this two month or eight week period, the placenta is functioning, although it's not fully developed yet, but it is doing its job of secreting HCG. The basic body plan of the organ system is in place and the embryonic membranes have developed. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So the embryonic membranes are referred to as the germ layers. When a blastocyst is implanting into the uterus, into that endometrial lining, the inner cell mass will start to go rapid changes and form three layers called primary germ layers. And those are the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So ectoderm will be the outer layer, meso is the middle, and endo um, is the So we have the developing embryo forming germ layers. So the blastocyst, when it implants into the uterus, it will form these three germ layers known as the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. These layers will differentiate into different tissues and organ structures, as you can see summarized here. Now, the ectoderm layer will become um, the hair, the nails, the skin, and the nervous system. The mesoderm will become the circulatory system, the lungs, well, the epithelial layers of the lungs, the skeletal system, and the muscular system, while the endoderm becomes the digestive system, liver, pancreas, and the inner layers of the lungs. So not the epithelial layers, but the inner layers. So when we're looking at this diagram, it's not a hard and fast rule, but we have the outer layer, the middle, and the inner layers. It's really important that you are able to name some of these structures in each layer. So looking at this table found in your textbook, again, you've got a little bit more detail here. Please make sure that you select at least three from each layer and you commit those to memory. This table might be slightly easier for you to remember, but this is what is given to you in your textbook. All right, so we're going to be looking at the embryonic membranes. So now that we've looked at the germ layers, the embryonic membranes are slightly different. And the two that we need to focus on are the amnion and the chorion. These are most important in human development. There are other layers that are more important in humans, but because this is human biology, we're just going to focus on these two. Now, the amnion forms around day eight, and it will surround the embryo. So this um, light orangey yellow line on the inside, this is the amnion, and the darker brown one on the outside is the chorion. The role of the amnion is to secrete amniotic fluid. It's really important. The amnion secretes amniotic fluid, and this acts as a shock absorber for the developing embryo and later on it will start to maintain the temperature for the developing fetus. The chorion, also very, very important. This um, develops on the outside of the blastocyst and it surrounds the embryo and the three other layers. So the chorion is the outermost layer. Just for reference, this is the stages of human development and you can see here through here and up through here, this is the embryo development. And then at the bottom, we're starting to get to look more like a fetus. So the fetal period is in week nine of pregnancy, right up until birth, which is roughly about the 40th week. Now, during the fetal period, we are referring to the, the developing individual as a fetus. And this is characterized by an increase in size of the fetus and maturation of organs. 
Now notice the word maturation here. So the organs are maturing. They've been built and laid down in the embryonic phase. Okay, so that's the end of this lesson. Please make sure that you complete page 24 of your booklet and read pages 309 to 310 of your textbook.